From Pasadena, California, we bring you the award-winning show, Encore Cafe. Today, we travel to South El Monte, where our reporter, Jack Wilson, talks with the founder of the American Military Museum. And he also speaks to some of the soldiers of the 82nd Airborne Division's Living History Association. Now, here's Jack. Welcome to Encore Cafe. We are in South El Monte. This place, Craig, is just, it's, the museum is really great. I love it. How long, long have you been here at this museum? We came to this facility in 1978. Uh, we just been collecting this for such a nice long time. My dad's, his, his dream to make a nice military museum to represent oh, the people, what the equipment was. The most important thing that a lot of the soldiers remember is a truck that they used to drive or an M16 half track they used to drive or a tank. Because just remember, most of, the, most of their excitement in their life was that three or four years that they, they filmed in World War II. But they were actually in World War II. You know, they were a young kid that came off the farm, never had experience. They can jump into a tank that's worth a million dollars. And that was their most exciting part of their life. And this equipment that we're looking at is different wars. World War II, oh, Korea. Oh, yes. We, we have stuff that started World War I. And we go to modern day. I have stuff that was in the first desert storm. We're looking at a Huey helicopter. A Huey helicopter was used primarily in Vietnam and after. The helicopters were used in artillery or in uh, air reconnaissance and used for evacuating the uh, sick and injured in Korea. And in Vietnam, they decided, gee, this would be kind of kind of nice to have like an air cab. So they started to put guns on them. And it's very effective to get the guys in and out. You don't have to worry about roads or getting mined on the way in. And the air cab was brought in in Vietnam, and we used it a whole bunch and the easiest thing to do when you get a guy wounded is to get him in a chopper and get him to to, to uh, somewhere to save his life there's a, like an hour you have like a golden hour if it takes too long to get him to medical treatment that's it you said air cav what, yeah what? air cavalry oh, air okay, cav was okay. used to uh, get the guys and and kind of jump them in a lot of airborne units used to jump and now they just repel off of the birds now Right at this facility, we have 170 displays, and uh, we're looking to build that up a little bit more. Anyway, Craig, walking around here in the museum, I saw this duck. That's what they called them in the World War II. Uh, and I noticed that the, some of the cities, Philadelphia, they have the duck for the sure. people this very day to ride as a, as a uh, I, I call it a tourist trap. But they ride around Philadelphia, downtown Philadelphia, then they go into the river. Seattle has them, uh, all modernized and refurbished. But this stuck really, I saw it and it turned me on. Tell us about it. Well, the amazing thing was uh, when they were designing this, basically uh, General Motors designed a two and a half ton truck, which was the workhorse of the whole World right. War II. And they go, gee, what can we do to make this amphibious? Let's build a boat around a truck. So they took the basic truck, put the components into a big boat-like shell, and they used it quite a bit. The uh, life expectancy of it was maybe two months, three months, four or five yeah. landings. And 60 years later, they're still doing it. Yeah. In Wisconsin Dells, they have over 80 of these vehicles. And they're constantly rebuilding them. And uh, that tourist thing, you know, they get 30 dudes, chuck them in there, run them around for an hour, kick them out, go get 30 more. And there's a lot of, a lot of those tours around the United States. You know the tour is going because when you're walking through the streets of Philadelphia, everybody's going around blowing, it looks like a kazoo. But oh, when you fabulous. get on the duck, the driver, the captain, or the pilot of the duck gives you a little kazoo and they go quack, 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 and everybody around the city walking around quack, quack, they, so you know they've been on the duck. That's it's, excellent it's quite advertising. A, quite an attraction. It's very good. It's a lot of fun. Uh, this particular vehicle is a actually mobile 155. We're getting into some big artillery now. After, after World War II, they decided, gee, you know, it's a good idea if you have artillery that has a little cover on it. So they kind of armored it a little bit. And in 1953, they, they were figuring that uh, there might be some nuclear fallout. So they actually put you know gaskets on it and try to pressurize the system. But this piece was given to us by the Marine Corps. It was taken off of a firing range. We haven't got to uh, restoring it yet. But we'll, we'll fix up our little dents and we'll put some new paint on. And every summer I get kids in a youth program at teaching to paint it. And the kids just are absolutely fabulous. I have kids from, say, 15 to about 17 years old. And I've been doing that for 23 years now. And this is called them, you know, like body work and how to be good little little workers. You know, this is the first job they've ever had. You know better than I do. Maybe there's something that you can tell me about this particular vehicle that well, I don't know. 
Craig, I think I can tell you everything about this vehicle. I literally lived on it, in it, and on it for three and a half years. I was the gunner. We had a five-man crew. We had two cannoneers. Where you're standing, where I'm at, was two 50 caliber machine guns here and two over there. And we had a left cannoneer and a right cannoneer. Fired 2,000, uh, 1,000 rounds a minute out of each side. So we had 2,000 rounds a minute coming out of here, a 50 caliber machine gun. Uh, airplanes was our basic training in, in Georgia, where we trained uh, to shoot aircraft. Uh, land was our second target, and water was our third target. We, so the main target was aircraft, but once we got in Europe, they put us in as a, as a security for other troops. We went to a division. We were a little outfit of 700 strong. We joined a division of 13,000, so we became their security, oh, our really? outfit. We had about 30 of these half-tracks. We had another half-track that had two 50 caliber machine guns with a 37-millimeter uh, cannon. That was oh, an M15. Wow. And then we had a driver and another gentleman that was just a, a, a stand-in, so to speak. We had five-man crew. And I would, as we rode down the highways and through, through towns in Europe, I sat with my feet inside with my butt on that crossbar there, sitting there watching the people and waving. And uh, any time there was a target or problem, all I had to do was slide in it. Naturally, if I was away from the vehicle, I ran and went up the side and in. But as this, and this was an M16, 450. So, this was my baby and I loved it. I was the gunner. This here came with a sight. They had a called the Navy Mark 9 Mark 9 sight. Oh, I have a real sight, but unfortunately they're worth like $2,000, so I don't leave them on. Well, you could find them all over Europe because the first thing we did was get a screwdriver and throw them away. Oh, wow. I don't know what they cost, but they're all over Europe because we found that a better uh, sight was the tracer bullet. We had uh, four bullets, uh, the shells would come out of there, the t uh, bullets would come out, and you had a tracer, you had a, an armor piercing, you had a, a, a incinerary, and then a standard shell would come out. But you'd follow that bullet, you'd follow that tracer to, for your target on the ground or in the air. So, but we, we did mostly groundwork with them. Uh, and again, like I said, security and leading the other troops and helping the infantry when the foot infantry couldn't get through a, a, a block of enemy, we'd go up and wipe the enemy out and then the foot infantry could go ahead. M16, this was great. I've enjoyed every minute of it. And I understand your dad's here. Maybe yeah, my dad's know. here at the museum and uh, I'll get him for you. Let's go, let's go talk to your dad. Yes, sir. Okay. Don, I just had the pleasure of spending some time with your son, Craig. Uh -huh. He took me all through the museum, a lot of fun. But I wanted to say hello to you. You're the one that started it all. Yes. Tell us about it, we you, Don? Well, when I got out of the regular army, uh, I took over the California National Guard Post Exchange in the Exposition Park Armory. And I was there for 22 years until the uh, Army, or rather National Guard, moved down to Los Alamitos. Mm -hmm. uh, during that inner period of time, we had an inter-service PX. We served all of the reservists uh, in the greater Los Angeles area, and we were also the contractor to every school, college, in Southern California. Uh, for about 15 years, we did all the advanced ROTC programs, and I personally used to go out, measure the students, and uh, set them up for tailoring I do all the fittings myself. And of course, uh, when uh, the National Guard uh, moved, we ceased doing that. And uh, I retired, the, well, practically retired since then. But when I was in the Exposition Park Armory, uh, many of the people, or soldiers, sailors, who would retire from the service wouldn't know what to do with their uniforms or memorabilia that they picked up, mm -hmm. and they brought it to us. And we got such a avalanche of material after a while that it was suggested that we start a museum. And the Army uh, Colonel from the Army Public Information Office had recently set up a museum in uh, Chicago, and he helped us set up our corporation, the nonprofit, uh, in 1962. And this all grew, uh, not on purpose, it just grew. And then it 
took me over and uh, various peoples who uh, have various interests with volunteer time to us. We're back now where we need help. And we're looking for those people who have uh, expertise in various phases of the Army or the services, any service, Air Force, whatever it is, to give us a hand. Uh, they can come in at their leisure, their time, and we do have a very small amount of funds for some specialists. Well, right now, at this present time, your son is running the museum. Yes. Craig, you, are, you are retired? Uh, I'm retired to the fact that I come here every day. Yeah. I, I'm, not re I, I'm retired uh, in essence, but I'm here all the time. May I, I ask your age, Don? What is I'm 87. 87. This August. Well, it's been a pleasure being your guest today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure meeting you and your... How are you today? I'm fine. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Listen, 82nd Airborne. Right. Tell me about you, please. Tell me about your outfit. Well, our organization is called the 82nd Airborne Division Living History Association. Living History. Yeah. And what we like to do is we like to go ahead and recreate that period of time in World War II that the 82nd Airborne Division was jumping and fighting in Africa and Sicily and in France. So we wear the uniforms, have the equipment, set up encampments, and educate the public about what the veterans did. So our whole point is not to go out and run around on battlefields, but to educate the public at different places like air shows and uh, his military history museums like this. Michael, how, how you doing? How, how are you doing? doing? I want you to tell me about your equipment. I know you, I think you carry this on your back. We sure did. We, we carried it everywhere we can on us. We strapped it to our legs, we strapped it to our arm, our belt. Anywhere we can get equipment on, we took it with us. And you're also part of this uh, history Living of the history. 80s, living history of the 82nd Airborne. Right, right. And like Mark was telling me, uh, you fellows, uh, how strong are you as far as uh, membership? Membership, we're up to about 25 members strong. Uh, we have some more that are ready to go with us. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, non-interpretive members, a lot of uh, people who reenact re -enact with us as well in all other aspects of what we do. And are you doing this more or less on a weekly basis or once a month? or? Oh, maybe three times a month. We've got something going on with veterans associations, parades, and various other you know, activities. Well, that's where I had the pleasure of meeting you was yes, in the sir. Fourth of July parade. Yes, sir. Uh, I recognize your rating, and I think you, were, you got demoted. You were a T5 when I saw you there. Well, right now I'm portraying an earlier part of the war, so okay. I just went in. Oh, you just went in. Okay. Yeah, and then when you saw me, I had already, you know. Oh, you'd already... No bar Bart, fights. You no jumped bar. out of the plane when I saw you. Okay. <laughs> right. Good. Well, listen, tell us about some of this equipment. Well, let's start off with the uh, most exciting of all, the uh, BC-611. It's a handy talkie. Everybody always confuses this with... Two-way radio? Two-way radio. They confuse this with being the walkie-talkie, but it actually isn't. This is the handy talkie because... Why you didn't you use a cell phone? It was oh, much lighter. This is the actual <laughs> grandfather of the cell we phone. We didn't have cell phones in there This yet. is the Motorola this right here. Very good. Very good. And we have the M1 carbine. We also have these gentlemen here have the M1 Grand. Let me get that a minute. Sure. There we go. She feels heavy. I, I was, well, I was lighter, and this felt lighter when I carried these in World War II. That's awful heavy. Jeez. But go on, My, Michael. Right. You the, each trooper would be consist of having his cartridge belt, his E-tool, his uh, M36 suspenders, canteen, first aid pouch, uh, he would have a May West, he would have very other, various other tools particular to his job or what he would um, pick up on the way as well uh, from any other soldiers or whatever he needed for his operation. Extra ammo, ammo bag, uh, bag for other equipment, um, whatever he can he would pretty much strap to his body. Uh, May West and his rope to get down out of trees in case he landed in a tree. You mm -hmm. also have the uh, signal gun. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, this uh, you I see also you carry a sidearm. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very good. Well, I'll tell you, meeting you guys, it's it's been a pleasure. It's been a nice day for me. We've been a tour of the museum here in El Monte or South El Monte. It was nice to meet you, Michael, and all you young men. Thank you, sir. Keep up the good work.